Gentry, Wikipedia Audio Gentry are well-born, genteel, and well-bred people of high social class, especially in the past. Gentry, in its widest connotation, refers to people of good social position connected to landed estates, upper levels of the clergy, and gentle families of long descent who never obtained the official right to bear a coat of arms. The historical term gentry by itself, so Peter Koss argues, is a construct that historians have applied loosely to rather different societies. Any particular model may not fit a specific society, yet a single definition nevertheless remains desirable. In the United Kingdom, the term generally refers to the landed gentry, the majority of the members of the landowning social class who did not possess titles of nobility, though they would typically be army jaris. The need for such a term was created by the very small size by European standards of the peerage of England and those of other parts of Britain, with nobility and titles only being inherited by a single individual, rather than the whole family having the status of nobility, as was typically the case in Europe. The fundamental social division in most parts of Europe in the Middle Ages was between the nobles, i.e., the tenants in chivalry, and the ignobles, i.e., the villains, citizens and burgesses. The division into nobles and ignobles in smaller regions of Europe in the Middle Ages was less exact. After the Reformation, intermingling between the noble class and the often hereditary clerical upper class became a distinctive feature in several Nordic countries. Historical Background of Social Stratification in the West Besides the gentry there have been other analogous traditional elites. The adjective patrician for example describes most closely members of the governing elites found within metropolitan areas like the medieval free cities of Italy, the free imperial cities of Germany and Switzerland, and the areas of the Hansa Attic League, which, by virtue of their urban milieu, differed from the gentry. The Indo-Europeans who settled Europe, Western Asia and the Indian subcontinent conceived their societies to be ordered in a tripartite fashion, the three parts being castes. Castes came to be further divided, perhaps as a result of greater specialization. Indo-Iranian Brahmin slash Athravan, Kshatriyas slash Radhaistar, Vaishyas, Roman Flamens, Melitas, Quirites, Celtic Druids, Equites, Plebes, Anglo-Saxon Gebedmen, Ferdmen, Wetorkmen, Slavic Folks, Voin, Krestianen slash Smerd, Nordic Earl, Churl, Thrall, Greece Eupatridae, Geomori, Demiurgi, Greece Homoioi, Perioasi, Helots. The classic formulation of the caste system as largely described by Georges Dumazil was that of a priestly or religiously occupied caste, a warrior caste, and a worker caste. Dumazil divided the Proto-Indo-Europeans into three categories, sovereignty, military, and productivity. He further subdivided sovereignty into two distinct and complementary sub-parts. One part was formal, juridical, and priestly, but rooted in this world. The other was powerful, unpredictable, and also priestly, but rooted in the other, the supernatural, and spiritual world. The second main division was connected with the use of force, the military, and war. Finally, there was a third group, ruled by the other two, whose role was productivity, herding, farming, and crafts. This system of caste roles can be seen in the castes which flourished on the Indian subcontinent and amongst the Italic peoples. Examples of the Indo-European castes Kings were born out of the warrior or noble class. 
Emperor Constantine convoked the First Council of Nicaea in 325 whose Nicene Creed included belief in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Emperor Theodosius I made Nicene Christianity the state church of the Roman Empire with the Edict of Thessalonica of 380. First estate included the group of all clergy, that is, members of the higher clergy and the lower clergy, second estate has been encapsulated by the nobility. Here too, it did not matter whether they came from a lower or higher nobility or if they were impoverished members, third estate included all nominally free citizens, in some places, free peasants. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century, there emerged no single powerful secular government in the West, but there was a central ecclesiastical power in Rome, the Catholic Church. In this power vacuum, the Church rose to become the dominant power in the West. In essence, the earliest vision of Christendom was a vision of a Christian theocracy, a government founded upon and upholding Christian values whose institutions are spread through and over with Christian doctrine. The Catholic Church's peak of authority over all European Christians and their common endeavors of the Christian community for example, the Crusades, the fight against the Moors in the Iberian Peninsula and against the Ottomans in the Balkans helped to develop a sense of communal identity against the obstacle of Europe's deep political divisions cultivate themselves morally, participate in the correct performance of ritual, show filial piety and loyalty where these are due, and, cultivate humaneness. Medieval Christendom The classical heritage flourished throughout the Middle Ages in both the Byzantine Greek East and Latin West. In Plato's ideal state there are three major classes, which was representative of the idea of the tripartite soul, which is expressive of three functions or capacities of the human soul, appetites, the spirited element and reason the part that must guide the soul to truth. Will Durant made a convincing case that certain prominent features of Plato's ideal community were discernible in the organization, dogma, and effectiveness of the medieval church in Europe. For a thousand years Europe was ruled by an order of guardians considerably like that which was visioned by our philosopher. During the Middle Ages it was customary to classify the population of Christendom into laborators, bellators, and orators. The last group, though small in number, monopolized the instruments and opportunities of culture and ruled with almost unlimited sway half of the most powerful continent on the globe. The clergy, like Plato's guardians, were placed in authority, by their talent as shown in ecclesiastical studies and administration, by their disposition to a life of meditation and simplicity, a and d. by the influence of their relatives with the powers of state and church. In the latter half of the period in which they ruled, the clergy were as free from family cares as even Plato could desire. Celibacy was part of the psychological structure of the power of the clergy, for on the one hand they were unimpeded by the narrowing egoism of the family, and on the other their apparent superiority to the call of the flesh added to the awe in which lay sinners held them. Gaetano Mosca wrote on the same subject matter in his book The Ruling Class Concerning the Medieval Church and Its Structure that Beyond the fact that clerical celibacy functioned as a spiritual discipline it also was guarantor of the independence of the Church. The Catholic Church has always aspired to a preponderant share in political power, it has never been able to monopolize it entirely because of two traits, chiefly, that are basic in its structure. Celibacy has generally been required of the clergy and of monks. Therefore no real dynasties of abbots and bishops have ever been able to establish themselves. Secondly, 
in spite of numerous examples to the contrary supplied by the warlike Middle Ages, the ecclesiastical calling has by its very nature never been strictly compatible with the bearing of arms. The precept that exhorts the Church to abhor bloodshed has never dropped completely out of sight, and in relatively tranquil and orderly times it has always been very much to the fore. The gentry is formed on the basis of the medieval society's two higher estates of the realm, nobility, and clergy, both exempted from tax. Subsequent gentle families of long descent who never obtained official rights to bear a coat of arms were also admitted to the rural upper-class society, the gentry. The Three Estates Two principal estates of the realm Gentries The widespread Three Estates order was particularly characteristic of France. Continental Europe Baltic Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth Spain and Portugal Swedish At the top of the pyramid were the princes and estates of the king or emperor, or with the clergy, the bishops, and the pope. The feudal system was, for the people of the Middle Ages and early modern period, fitted into a God-given order. The nobility and the third estate were born into their class, and change in social position was slow. Wealth had little influence on what estate one belonged to. The exception was the medieval church, which was the only institution where competent men of merit could reach, in one lifetime, the highest positions in society. The first estate comprised the entire clergy, traditionally divided into higher and lower clergy. Although there was no formal demarcation between the two categories, the upper clergy were, effectively, clerical nobility, from the families of the second estate or as in the case of Cardinal Wolsey, from more humble backgrounds. Ukraine The second estate was the nobility. Being wealthy or influential did not automatically make one a noble, and not all nobles were wealthy and influential. Countries without a feudal tradition did not have a nobility as such. The nobility of a person might be either inherited or earned. Nobility in its most general and strict sense is an acknowledged preeminence that is hereditary, legitimate descendants of nobles are nobles unless explicitly stripped of the privilege. The terms aristocrat and aristocracy are a less formal means to refer to persons belonging to this social milieu. Historically in some cultures, members of an upper class often did not have to work for a living, as they were supported by earned or inherited investments, although members of the upper class may have had less actual money than merchants. Upper-class status commonly derived from the social position of one's family and not from one's own achievements or wealth. Much of the population that comprised the upper class consisted of aristocrats, ruling families, titled people, and religious hierarchs. These people were usually born into their status, and historically, there was not much movement across class boundaries. This is to say that it was much harder for an individual to move up in class simply because of the structure of society. In many countries, the term upper class was intimately associated with hereditary land ownership and titles. Political power was often in the hands of the landowners in many pre-industrial societies, despite there being no legal barriers to land ownership for other social classes. Power began to shift from upper-class landed families to the general population in the early modern age, leading to marital alliances between the two groups, providing the foundation for the modern upper classes in the West. Upper-class landowners in Europe were often also members of the titled nobility, though not necessarily, the prevalence of titles of nobility varied widely from country to country. 
Some upper classes were almost entirely untitled, for example, the Zlachta of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Before the age of absolutism, institutions, such as the church, legislatures, or social elites, restrained monarchical power. Absolutism was characterized by the ending of feudal partitioning, consolidation of power with the monarch, rise of state, rise of professional standing armies, professional bureaucracies, the codification of state laws, and the rise of ideologies that justify the absolutist monarchy. Hence, absolutism was made possible by new innovations and characterized as a phenomenon of early modern Europe, rather than that of the Middle Ages, where the clergy and nobility counterbalanced as a result of mutual rivalry. From the middle of the 1860s the privileged position of Baltic Germans in the Russian Empire began to waver. Already during the reign of Nicholas I, who was under pressure from Russian nationalists, some sporadic steps had been taken towards the Russification of the provinces. Later, the Baltic Germans faced fierce attacks from the Russian nationalist press, which accused the Baltic aristocracy of separatism, and advocated closer linguistic and administrative integration with Russia. Social division was based on the dominance of the Baltic Germans which formed the upper classes while the majority of indigenous population, called Unjits, composed the peasantry. In the imperial census of 1897, 98,573 Germans lived in the governorate of Livonia, 51,017 in the governorate of Kuronia and 16,037 in the governorate of Estonia. The social changes faced by the emancipation, both social and national, of the Estonians and Latvians were not taken seriously by the Baltic German gentry. The provisional government of Russia after 1917 revolution gave the Estonians and Latvians self-governance which meant the end of the Baltic German era in Baltics. United Kingdom The Lithuanian gentry consisted mainly of Lithuanians, but due to strong ties to Poland, had been culturally Polonized. After the Union of Lublin in 1569, they became less distinguishable from Polish Zlachta, although preserved Lithuanian national awareness. In the history of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, Gentry is often used in English to describe the Polish landed gentry. They were the lesser members of the nobility, contrasting with the much smaller but more powerful group of magnate families, the magnates of Poland and Lithuania. Compared to the situation in England and some other parts of Europe, these two parts of the overall nobility to a large extent operated as different classes, and were often in conflict. After the partitions of Poland, at least in the stereotypes of 19th century nationalist lore, the magnates often made themselves at home in the capitals and courts of the partitioning powers, while the gentry remained on their estates, keeping the national culture alive. Irish From the 15th century, only the Zlachta, and a few patrician bugers from some cities, were allowed to own rural estates of any size, as part of the very extensive Zlachta privileges. These restrictions were reduced or removed after the partitions of Poland, and commoner landowners began to emerge. By the 19th century, there were at least 60,000 Zlachta families, most rather poor, and many no longer owning land. By then the gentry included many non-noble landowners. In Spanish nobility and former Portuguese nobility, see Hidalgos and Infanzons. United States East Asia Four occupations In Sweden, there was not outright serfdom. 
hence, the gentry was basically a class of well-off citizens that had grown from the wealthier or more powerful members of the peasantry. The two historically legally privileged classes in Sweden were the Swedish nobility, a rather small group numerically, and the clergy, which were part of the so-called frills. At the head of the Swedish clergy stood the Archbishop of Uppsala since 1164. The clergy encompassed almost all the educated men of the day and furthermore was strengthened by considerable wealth and thus it came naturally to play a significant political role. Until the Reformation, the clergy was the first estate but was relegated to the secular estate in the Protestant North Europe. In the Middle Ages, celibacy in the Catholic Church had been a natural barrier to the formation of an hereditary priestly class. After compulsory celibacy was abolished in Sweden during the Reformation, the formation of a hereditary priestly class became possible, whereby wealth and clerical positions were frequently inheritable. Hence the bishops and the vicars, who formed the clerical upper class, would frequently have manners similar to those of other country gentry. Hence continued the medieval church legacy of the intermingling between noble class and clerical upper class and the intermarriage as the distinctive element in several Nordic countries after the Reformation. Surnames in Sweden can be traced to the 15th century, when they were first used by the gentry, i.e., priests, and nobles. The names of these were usually in Swedish, Latin, German or Greek. The adoption of Latin names was first used by the Catholic clergy in the 15th century. The given name was preceded by Herr, such as Herr Lars, Herr Olaf, Herr Hans, followed by a Latinized form of patronymic names, e.g., Lars Peterson Latinized as Laurentius Petri. Starting from the time of the Reformation, the Latinized form of their birthplace became a common naming practice for the clergy. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the surname was only rarely the original family name of the ennobled, usually, a more imposing new name was chosen. This was a period which produced a myriad of two-word Swedish language family names for the nobility. The regular difference with Britain was that it became the new surname of the whole house, and the old surname was dropped altogether. The Western Ukrainian clergy of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church were a hereditary tight-knit social caste that dominated Western Ukrainian society from the late 18th until the mid-20th centuries, following the reforms instituted by Joseph II, Emperor of Austria because, like their Orthodox brethren, Ukrainian Catholic priests could marry, they were able to establish priestly dynasties, often associated with specific regions, for many generations. Numbering approximately 2,0002,500 by the 19th century, priestly families tended to marry within their group, constituting a tight-knit hereditary caste. In the absence of a significant native nobility and enjoying a virtual monopoly on education and wealth within Western Ukrainian society, the clergy came to form that group's native aristocracy. The clergy adopted Austria's role for them as bringers of culture and education to the Ukrainian countryside. Most Ukrainian social and political movements in Austrian-controlled territory emerged or were highly influenced by the clergy themselves or by their children. This influence was so great that Western Ukrainians were accused of wanting to create a theocracy in Western Ukraine by their Polish rivals. The central role played by the Ukrainian clergy or their children in Western Ukrainian society would weaken somewhat at the end of the 19th century but would continue until the mid-20th century. The British upper classes consist of two sometimes overlapping entities, the peerage and landed gentry, any male member of either may regard himself as a gentleman, 
in a special sense mutually understood between hereditary members of the class, which will often exclude life peers. In the British peerage, only the senior family member inherits a substantive title, these are referred to as peers or lords. The rest of the nobility are referred to as landed gentry. Except for the eldest sons of peers, who bear their father's inferior titles as courtesy titles, they usually bear no titles apart from the qualifications of esquire or gentleman, exceptions include the baronet, those that are knighted, Scottish barons, and Scottish lairds. The term landed gentry, although originally used to mean nobility, came to be used for the lesser nobility in England around 1540. Once identical, these terms eventually became complementary. The term gentry by itself, as commonly used by historians, according to Peter Koss, is a construct applied loosely to rather different societies. Any particular model may not fit a specific society, yet a single definition nevertheless remains desirable. Titles, while often considered central to the upper class, are not strictly so. Both Captain Mark Phillips and Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence, the respective first and second husbands of H.R.H. Princess Anne, lacked any rank of peerage at the time of their marriage to Princess Anne. However, the backgrounds of both men were considered to be essentially patrician, and they were thus deemed suitable husbands for a princess. The landed gentry is a traditional British social class consisting of gentlemen in the original sense, that is, those who owned land in the form of country estates to such an extent that they were not required to actively work, except in an administrative capacity on their own lands. The estates were often made up of tenanted farms, in which case the gentleman could live entirely off rent income. Esquire is a term derived from the French acquire the lowest designation for a nobleman, referring only to males and used to denote a high but indeterminate social status. The most common occurrence of term esquire today is the conferral as the suffix esq in order to pay an informal compliment to a male recipient by way of implying gentle birth. In the post-medieval world, the title of esquire came to apply to all men of the higher landed gentry, an esquire ranks socially above a gentleman but below a knight. In the modern world, where all men are assumed to be gentlemen, the term has often been extended to all men without any higher title. It is used post-nominally, usually in abbreviated form. A knight can be either a medieval tenant giving military service as a mounted man-at-arms to a feudal landholder, or a medieval gentleman soldier, usually highborn raised by a sovereign to privileged military status after training as a page and squire. In formal protocol, sir is the correct styling for a knight or for a baronet, used with the knight's given name or full name, but not with the surname alone. The equivalent for a woman who holds the title in her own right is dame, for such women, the title dame is used as sir for a man never before the surname on its own. This usage was devised in 1917, derived from the practice, up to the 17th century, for the wife of a knight. The wife of a knight or baronet is now styled lady. The colonial American use of gentry followed the British usage, before the independence of the United States, Southern planters were often the younger sons of British landowners, who perpetuated the British system in rural Virginia and Charleston, South Carolina, by employing tenant farmers, indentured servants, and chattel slaves. In the northeastern United States, the gentry included offshoot families who established the city of Boston, Massachusetts, and Harvard and Yale colleges. 
The families of Virginia formed the Virginia Gentry class as the old guard of plantation owners in United States. As General Robert E. Lee's paternal ancestors were among the earliest settlers in Virginia, his family was considered among the oldest of the Virginia Gentry class. The concept of the gentleman farmer as a man who farms mainly for pleasure rather than for profit was not only a model for the southern gentry, but very much an ideal befitting some of founding fathers of America, such as Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Washington resumed the life of a gentleman farmer at his Mount Vernon estate in Virginia following his resignation as Commander-in-Chief of the Army in December 1783. The American gentry, even in cases where the family never had obtained official rights to bear a coat of arms in history, bore all the same hallmarks of traditional elite as in the old continent. First families of Virginia originated with colonists from England who primarily settled at Jamestown and along the James River and other navigable waters in the colony of Virginia during the 17th century. As there was a propensity to marry within their narrow social scope for many generations, many descendants bear surnames which became common in the growing colony. Many of the original English colonists considered members of the first families of Virginia migrated to the colony of Virginia during the English Civil War and English Interregnum period. Royalists left England on the accession to power of Oliver Cromwell and his parliament. Because most of Virginia's leading families recognized Charles II as king following the execution of Charles I in 1649, Charles II is reputed to have called Virginia his Old Dominion, a nickname that endures today. Most of such early settlers in Virginia were so-called second sons. Primogeniture favored the first sons inheriting lands and titles in England. Virginia evolved in a society of second or third sons of English aristocracy who inherited land grants or land in Virginia. They formed part of the southern elite in America. Many of the great Virginia dynasties traced their roots to families like the Lees and the Fitzhughes, who traced lineage to England's county families and baronial legacies. But not all. Even the most humble Virginia immigrants aspired to the English manorial trappings of their betters. The colonial families of Maryland were the leading families in the province of Maryland. Several also had interests in the colony of Virginia, and the two are sometimes referred to as the Chesapeake colonies. Many of the early settlers came from the West Midlands in England although the Maryland families were composed of a variety of European nationalities, e.g., French, Irish, Welsh, Scottish, and Swedish, in addition to English. Charles I of England granted the province Palatinate status under Cecilius Calvert, 2nd Baron Baltimore. The foundational charter created an aristocracy of lords of the manor for Maryland. Maryland was uniquely created as a colony for Catholic aristocracy and landed gentry, but Anglicanism eventually came to dominate, partly through influence from neighboring Virginia. The four divisions of society refers to the model of society in ancient China and was a meritocratic social class system in China and other subsequently influenced Confucian societies. The four castes gentry, farmers, artisans, and merchants are combined to form the term SHNNGGNGSHA with MACRONNG. Gentry means different things in different countries. In China, Korea, and Vietnam, this meant that the Confucian scholar gentry that would for the most part make up most of the bureaucracy. This caste would comprise both the more or less hereditary aristocracy as well as the meritocratic scholars that rise through the rank by public service and, later, by imperial exams. Some sources, such as Sunzi, list farmers before the gentry, 
based on the Confucian view that they directly contributed to the welfare of the state. In China, the farmer lifestyle is also closely linked with the ideals of Confucian gentlemen. In Japan, this caste essentially equates to the samurai class. In the Edo period, with the creation of the domains under the rule of Tokugawa Ieyasu, all land was confiscated and reissued as fiefdoms to the daimis. The small lords, the samurai, were ordered either to give up their swords and rights and remain on their lands as peasants or to move to the castle cities to become paid retainers of the daimis. Only a few samurai were allowed to remain in the countryside, the landed samurai. Some five percenter of the population were samurai. Only the samurai could have proper surnames, which after the Meiji Restoration, became compulsory to all inhabitants. There were two leading classes, i.e. the gentry, in the time of feudal Japan, the daimi and the samurai. The Confucian ideals in the Japanese culture emphasized the importance of productive members of society, so farmers and fishermen were considered of a higher status than merchants. Emperor Meiji abolished the samurai's right to be the only armed force in favor of a more modern, western-style, conscripted army in 1873. Samurai became Shizoku but the right to wear a katana in public was eventually abolished along with the right to execute commoners who paid them disrespect. In defining how a modern Japan should be, members of the Meiji government decided to follow in the footsteps of the United Kingdom and Germany, basing the country on the concept of noblesse oblige. Samurai were not to be a political force under the new order. The difference between the Japanese and European feudal systems was that European feudalism was grounded in Roman legal structure, while Japan feudalism had Chinese Confucian morality as its basis. Korean monarchy and the native ruling upper class existed in Korea until the end of the Japanese occupation. The system concerning the nobility is roughly the same as that of the Chinese nobility. As the Jesuits and other preceding monastical orders did during Europe's Dark Ages, the Buddhist monks became the purveyors and guardians of Korea's literary traditions while documenting Korea's written history and legacies from the Silla period to the end of the Goryeo dynasty. Korean Buddhist monks also developed and used the first movable metal type printing presses in history some 500 years before Gutenberg to print ancient Buddhist texts. Buddhist monks also engaged in record keeping, food storage and distribution, as well as the ability to exercise power by influencing the Goryeo royal court. Historically, the nobles in Europe became soldiers the aristocracy in Europe can trace their origins to military leaders from the Migration Period and the Middle Ages. For many years, the British Army, together with the Church, was seen as the ideal career for the younger sons of the aristocracy. Although now much diminished, the practice has not totally disappeared. Such practices are not unique to the British either geographically or historically. As a very practical form of displaying patriotism, it has been at times fashionable for gentlemen to participate in the military. The fundamental idea of gentry had come to be that of the essential superiority of the fighting man, usually maintained in the granting of arms. At the last, the wearing of a sword on all occasions was the outward and visible sign of a gentleman, the custom survives in the sword worn with court dress. A suggestion that a gentleman must have a coat of arms was vigorously advanced by certain 19th and 20th century heraldists, notably Arthur Charles Fox Davies in England and Thomas Innes of Lerney in Scotland. The significance of a right to a coat of arms was that it was definitive proof of the status of gentlemen, 
but it recognized rather than conferred such a status, and the status could be and frequently was accepted without a right to a coat of arms. Chivalry is a term related to the medieval institution of knighthood. It is usually associated with ideals of knightly virtues, honor, and courtly love. Christianity had a modifying influence on the virtues of chivalry, with limits placed on knights to protect and honor the weaker members of society and maintain peace. The church became more tolerant of war in the defense of faith, espousing theories of the just war. In the 11th century, the concept of a Knight of Christ gained currency in France, Spain, and Italy. These concepts of religious chivalry were further elaborated in the era of the Crusades. In the later Middle Ages, wealthy merchants strove to adopt chivalric attitudes. This was a democratization of chivalry, leading to a new genre called the courtesy book, which were guides to the behavior of gentlemen. When examining medieval literature, chivalry can be classified into three basic but overlapping areas. These three areas obviously overlap quite frequently in chivalry and are often indistinguishable. Another classification of chivalry divides it into warrior, religious and courtly love strands. One particular similarity between all three of these categories is honor. Honor is the foundational and guiding principle of chivalry. Thus, for the knight, honor would be one of the guides of action. The term gentleman, in its original and strict signification, denoted a man of good family, analogous to the Latin gene rasus. In this sense the word equates with the French gentilhomme, which was in Great Britain long confined to the peerage. The term gentry has much of the social class significance of the French noblesse or of the German Adele, but without the strict technical requirements of those traditions. To a degree, gentlemen signified a man with an income derived from landed property, a legacy, or some other source and was thus independently wealthy and did not need to work. The Far East also held similar ideas to the West of what a gentleman is which are based on Confucian principles. The term JNZ is a term crucial to classical Confucianism. Literally meaning son of a ruler, prince, or noble, the ideal of a gentleman, proper man, exemplary person, or perfect man is that for which Confucianism exhorts all people to strive. A succinct description of the perfect man is one who combine the qualities of saint, scholar, and gentleman. A hereditary elitism was bound up with the concept, and gentlemen were expected to act as moral guides to the rest of society. They were too. The opposite of the JNZ was the Zyorn, literally small person or petty person. Like English small, the word in this context in Chinese can mean petty in mind and heart, narrowly self-interested, greedy, superficial, and materialistic. The idea of noblesse oblige, nobility obliges, among gentry is, as the Oxford English Dictionary expresses, that the term suggests noble ancestry constrains to honorable behavior, privilege entails to responsibility. Being a noble meant that one had responsibilities to lead, manage, and so on. One was not to simply spend one's time in idle pursuits. Hierarchical Structure of Feudal Japan A coat of arms is a heraldic device dating to the 12th century in Europe. It was originally a cloth tunic worn over or in place of armor to establish identity in battle. The coat of arms is drawn with heraldic rules for a person, family, or organization. Family coats of arms were originally derived from personal ones, which then became extended in time to the whole family. In Scotland, 
family coats of arms are still personal ones and are mainly used by the head of the family. Ecclesiastical heraldry is the tradition of heraldry developed by Christian clergy. Initially used to mark documents, ecclesiastical heraldry evolved as a system for identifying people and dioceses. It is most formalized within the Catholic Church, where most bishops, including the Pope, have a personal coat of arms. Clergy in Anglican, Lutheran, Eastern Catholic, and Orthodox churches follow similar customs. Korea Values and Traditions Military and Clerical Chivalry Gentlemen Confucianism Noblesse Oblige Heraldry Ecclesiastical Heraldry Notes